Hello, London. Welcome to the Manish Tiwari Show. This afternoon, we have with, uh, someone with us who is a very distinguished educator uh, who has also been for a very, very long period with a global organization called Amnesty International. Most of uh, you would have heard of the organization. As one has said, it has been at the forefront of human rights activism, standing up for the weak and the vulnerable and minorities across the world. He right now lectures at the Essex University. His name is Abbas Faz. And please welcome me in joining him uh, today, this afternoon, at the Manish Tiwari Show. Abbas, are you there? Yes, I am there. Thank you very much, Manish. Thanks Thank a lot, you. Abbas, it's for being here. Pleasure. It's an honor to be in your show. Thank you so much. Now, coming back to you, Abbas, before we start the show, I just wanted to give the viewers a brief synopsis of your spectacular work in the field of human rights. You've been there for 30 years. You, just, you were a senior researcher. You left the organization in 2016. And since then, you've been teaching at the Essex University in this particular uh, kind of stream, which we call human rights, which in my view is one of the most important and very, very uh, significant fields for a modern democracy to survive and thrive. Places where democracies have not been able to kind of succeed, at least in a sustainable way. And we know a lot of countries where that is the case, where we do see always a tussle between different forces, whether it be the religious forces or the army, uh, and democracy is almost threatened. And in those countries, what we find the first thing which gets abused is human rights. There is no proper way to channelize the rights of each and every individual. The constitution in those countries doesn't get upheld. Now, coming back to you, Abbas, since you've been kind of working in this space, today we see a new kind of threat. Still mm. yesterday, we had a threat in a very different way. We would talk about third world countries. We talk about certain countries in Africa and Asia where things were not so normal, where as per the Western standards, we were facing what we call a human rights abuse. But today, for the first time, globally, <coughs> we see a certain situation where in the most advanced democracies, where uh, you know countries like America, United States, countries in, in Europe, for the first time, the spotlight is not just on the third world countries, the spotlight is also on them. We have a certain kind of ultra-right wing nationalism taking over. And there is a debate whether we need to accord the same rights to every single individual, where we can afford to give every single individual the same kind of decorum which we afford to the majority. And again, there's an unprecedented sense of uh, crisis in certain ways, uh, where even organizations like Amnesty International are under the scanner, uh, they are no more the sacrosanct uh, human rights institution which we believe they were. So what are your views on this, uh, Abbas? Yeah, I mean, you have touched upon a number of very, very important areas. We, uh, <clears throat> I agree with you entirely that there is a serious threat against human rights, and this threat is not just coming from uh, kind of countries that you mentioned as third world countries, but also from the first world countries, from the second world countries. Uh, I uh, have my own views, Manish, on this. And if you allow me, I will actually sure. detail those views. Yeah. I do not actually believe, I do not divide people into left and right and religious or secular anymore. I used to be able to do that maybe many, mm -hmm. many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but um, since then, having worked with Amnesty for about 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, having worked on really kind of opposing repression and, and human rights violations in many different countries of the world, mm -hmm. I've come to see that really uh, the world is not divided into left or right or religious or secular. Mm -hmm. The world is actually divided, the peoples of the world are divided into two types of people. Mm -hmm. There are only two types in my perspective. Mm -hmm. 
those who want to expand the scope for freedoms, mm -hmm. which is democracy, human rights, all of those, and those who want to actually limit the scope for freedoms. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these two types of people, they can be anywhere. They can be in South Asia, they can be in the United States, they can be anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. In the United States, there are people who want to limit the scope for freedoms, mm -hmm. not just in their own country, but also in other, in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are also people in the United States mm -hmm. who want to widen the scope for freedoms, not just in the United States, but also Mm -hmm. in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And if you look at everywhere in the world, every single country mm -hmm. that you can think of, mm -hmm. we can see that people with whom, mm -hmm. as, a, as you and I, as human rights defenders, mm -hmm. with whom we can associate, mm -hmm. as people with whom we agree, mm -hmm. and there are people in those countries with whom we cannot agree because mm -hmm. they are supporting human rights violations, mm -hmm. human rights uh, abuses. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think human rights belong to everyone, and if we mm -hmm. if we look at it like that, we will feel a sense of global solidarity. Because what has happened is that you know with no no globalism, mm -hmm. the kind of you know expansion of uh, free market, mm -hmm. the uh, the gap, the inequality gap, has become a lot wider mm -hmm. than before. And it doesn't matter where you are, that inequality gap exists. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can feel solidarity with those people mm -hmm. who are at the receiving end of human rights issues, mm -hmm. at the receiving end of human rights violations, and we can actually oppose mm -hmm. the um, policies, the structures, the uh, kind of, you know, uh, the kind of strategies mm -hmm. that some governments are using to suppress people. So I thought, you know, I would actually explain my position like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, that's that's clear to me. I mean, yes, there are people everywhere in the globe, but the foundation of a democratic structure, which we want the world. I mean, most of us want the world to be a democracy, where uh, you know everyone is respected. That's the foundation of the enlightened world, or the world as we know since the time we have grown, or we came into this world. Uh, we had this huge sense of optimism. The world wars were behind us. Much uh, the darker chapters of human history, as we know, uh, were yeah. much behind us. You know, the dark ages were behind us. Yeah, sure. Uh, there's a call coming. We can take this call. Yeah, no problem. Hello? This is, uh, hi, the show is going on. I mean, I'm, I'm quite liking the show. Yep. I just have a question that uh, India has banned uh, uh, Amnesty International. So yep. do you think that the intolerance level in India has increased uh, a lot? And that is the reason Amnesty, the organization like Amnesty being banned? I was going to come to this uh, very important uh, question. And... Uh, I am very aware that uh, Indian government decided to freeze the account of Amnesty International, and that happened in the last six months. Uh, there is a certain amount of, uh, as you all know, the you know there's a there's a government uh, which is the Narendra Modi government, which believes in uh, a certain kind of ideological slant. Uh, without going into the good or bad of it what we have seen is that there is an increased pressure uh, from the government on NGOs and organizations which have been operating in India with overseas funding. Uh, and at the receiving end have been number of NGOs. The most prominent ones which have been targeted in the past include Greenpeace, which in my view was absolutely kind of uh, uh, sacrilegious. I mean, you know, what can you expect Greenpeace to do but only protect nature and environment? And the <laughs> second most prominent one, uh, which has been Amnesty International, uh, uh, and uh, I did go through the statements before, uh, you know, uh, today morning, and I found that Avinash Kumar, who, who heads uh, Amnesty International India, has uh, had a vociferous 
attack on the government's policies in trying to come curb human rights and freedom in India by targeting someone um, like Amnesty International. And uh, the government, on the other hand, uh, the Indian government has stated that although uh, Amnesty International is kind of uh, pretending to talk to the powers to be and standing up for human rights, but there have been serious lapses in its conduct. Now, we don't know what the truth is. I mean, but as we all are aware, uh, Amnesty International has a track record. It's kind of difficult to imagine what it would do so bad. You know, what could it be doing? I mean, why would it be doing money laundering and why it would it be taking money to India when we all are uh, when we all are aware that there are various ways to do that. You know, I mean, if you, the Hawala system, the Hundi system, or whatever you call it, they're still very much alive. I mean, why would someone like Amnesty International do that? So there seems to be, uh, uh, in my view, a suspicion on the government's intent. However, I'd like to invite uh, Abbas to put his views on this. Uh, I'm really disappointed because, I mean, I do not work with Amnesty anymore. I have worked with Amnesty in the past. So um, I'm very disappointed. Disappointed not just because the government of India is attacking Amnesty, but in my opinion, by doing that, the government of India is attacking all human rights defenders in South Asia. Because if you keep saying that, you know, South Asian countries are important, people in South Asia are important, and we know that they are important, because I consider myself to be really part of South Asia. So they are important. We are all very important people. But if you keep saying that, and then at the same time, you are trying to actually kind of somehow indicate that, no, these people are not important. I am the government of India. I can do whatever I want. I can actually, you know, kind of ban Amnesty International. I can impose restrictions on the work of a very reputable human rights organization. I can accuse them of mon money laundering. These accusations, this type of, you know, actually response to a human rights organization is not just an attack on that particular organization alone. I think it is an attack on the hopes and aspirations that many people have in South Asia. And I have a reason why I can say, I say that. Because, you know, we, India is allowing itself to lose that high moral grounds that really, you know, by history, by the kind of history of uh, uh, fight against, you know, uh, imperialism, by the history of fight against colonialism, it was gaining. I mean, you know, the constitution of India, I've been just before I you know, we, ha we had this discussion, Manish. Manish, I actually was reading the Constitution of India, and the Constitution of India is very, very clear. In fact, what the government of India is doing is against its own constitution. So if a government allows itself to, you know, take the country to the point where it is losing that moral high ground for human rights, for democracy, for the rule of law, for fairness in investigations, for, you know, kind of impartiality, for all of those. If the government is actually losing that moral ground, then, you know, what is going to be the fate of the rest of the region? So unless you really say that, you know, this region is able to sort itself out in terms of democracy, in terms of human rights, other countries don't have you know, a right to come and tell us because we organize ourselves in a very democratic way, in a human rights friendly way. Unless you say that, then you cannot actually uh, defend your kind of position as uh, supporters of human rights. And India is losing that. I think uh, it is also flouting their own constitution. Many countries in South Asia are looking to India, unfortunately. Uh, and when they see that, you know, India is flouting its own constitution, other governments in other parts of South Asia think that, you know, they are justified also, as we know, and I'm not going to name names just today, 
many of those countries are doing exactly the same. Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, and uh, but that is really my position. In, in your second question, I do not actually know the details of what has happened. What I know is that uh, when I was at Amnesty at that time, and I'm not talking on behalf of Amnesty, I'm just expressing my own kind of experience of this particular situation. Uh, at that time, there was an indication that, you know, the government of, because Amnesty was saying that, you know, we want to be closer to where human rights violations are taking place. Yeah. And the closer that you are, the you know, closer you are to the people, then you just, it's not like a, an organization that is talking to people from London, it is, you know, talking to people from the countries in which they actually uh, live. So at that time, this was, but there, there, there was a problem with the Indian law and they were, saying that they are going to, actually, they were going to sort it out at that time. Uh, and that problem was with their, uh, uh, I don't know what the law actually is called, something to do with foreign contribution. Uh, and so they were saying at that time that Amnesty is not allowed to uh, bring money from London to pay its staff in, in India. So you can only pay your staff in India if you raise the money from inside the country. But that really, my understanding, I, I could be wrong, but my understanding is that that was sorted out. They allowed Amnesty to take money from outside the country. But that was until, you know, they were, they were trying to bargain with, with Amnesty at that time. Unfortunately, Amnesty didn't accept that. Mm -hmm. So at that time, uh, the impression that I had as a just, you know, an interested person, I wasn't part yeah. of any negotiation whatsoever, but the impression that I had as an employee oh. of Amnesty okay. was okay. that uh, things had got sorted out. But, you know, this was the case and there was no serious so. problem until Amnesty began to talk about issues that mm -hmm. nobody else was able to talk about. Can you can you list well, those issues? What what were those issues uh, related to India, which Amnesty was well, talking about? Well, I mean, you know, the kind of amendment to the constitution which allowed uh, certain people not to seek asylum in uh, India. In, in India, for example, that is one of them, and nobody mm -hmm. else is because you know when when really you are a government that uh, kind of don't bother too much about human rights, mm -hmm. then, you know, journalists and media, of course, in India, they are very brave and, and, they, are, and they are very robust, but at the same time, they are under a huge amount of pressure. So it is left to an organization like Amnesty International to raise those issues. So there are many other issues. Uh, Amnesty from, you know, the statement that, uh, um, uh, Amnesty has issued, I found that they have been uh, giving evidence to some other mm -hmm. organizations, you know, international hearings uh, about what is happening in Jammu and Kashmir. Yeah. And Jammu and Kashmir, the government of India doesn't want anyone to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But a human rights organization cannot just keep quiet about that because they have to actually discuss that. So, but that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, amnesty or other human rights defenders who are talking about Kashmir, mm -hmm. who are talking about the situation there. It doesn't mean that they agree with, you know, violence taking place and they are supporting, you know, any special movement. That is not the case, in fact. Amnesty doesn't support violence. Yeah. No human rights organization can support violence. But what they are saying is that, you know, people should not be tortured. Mm -hmm. People should receive a fair trial if they are arrested. Mm -hmm. The, the fair trial should be based on, you know, principles that mm -hmm. Indian government, Indian state, if you like, because mm -hmm. there's a state between, there's a difference between a state mm -hmm. and government. A mm -hmm. state is something that's, that continues. Mm -hmm. Government is temporary, comes and goes. I mean, we don't know. After Modi, we don't know who is going to be the government in India. So, so governments, governments are obliged to accept the mm -hmm. commitments that have been made by the state. Mm -hmm. The state of India will continue. The state of Bangladesh 
will continue. The governments in Bangladesh and India, they come and go. So the government in any part of the world, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Burma, wherever you want to call it, the governments in these parts of the world, they are actually coming and going. And they are obliged to put into practice the commitments that the state has made. And yeah. the state of India has made a lot of commitments mm -hmm. about can I just, human rights. Can I just interrupt you there? So coming back to uh, you know the Indian legacy, I mean, you do know about Mahatma Gandhi and uh, you know the kind of stance he took even against the British government. And that mm -hmm. was at a basic level reciprocity of the goodness in the other person. So even though India was under imperialistic rule, uh, Mahatma Gandhi in his whole life never made an allegation against the British based on, uh, on, on those kind of, uh, you know, uh, beliefs that uh, they were the evil. In fact, he went out of his way and supported them from time to time. And so the Indian democracy is founded on those principles where the other is not seen as the problem. The problem mm -hmm. is with the situation, with uh, you know how things have been dealt with, or with the powers to be, and that Gandhian legacy was carried out by the uh, Indian political leaders, and at least in the formative years, uh, in the years of Nehru, and so on and so forth. And then we had a very positive development from India in terms of non-aligned movement, you know, which uh, was there uh, as the bedrock of Indian democracy, where it tried not to align uh, with. Uh, uh, with the overarching forces of capitalistic uh, world, uh, tried to create a neutral path. It succeeded or didn't succeed. Uh, that is not um, for me to say. Uh, you know, obviously, India was also closely identified with Russia, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So th there has been a certain kind of history, uh, and Indian rights, uh, Indian human rights movement has got that credence. You know, the state and the religion are at. Uh, you know, or at least till now, they were uh, at arm's length. The state did not meddle uh, in certain things, in certain situations. And you had some very strong civil rights uh, institutions in India, which kind of uh, continue to do the good work. But I do see that there is a certain amount of now, uh, a question mark, a threat. And mm -hmm. uh, it's also coming from grassroots levels journalists, a lot of them feel the heat, the amount of trolling which goes on in media in India, whenever someone goes against the populist views, is unprecedented. I mean, you have like an army of trolls, which will take mm. down anyone. So if you were to say something which is not in sync with what mm. a certain section of society wants to hear, you definitely will be abused. And there's no law against that. You know, so we are historically at odds, you know, so you just can't raise your hand and stand up and say your views, you are almost subject to uh, mm. a mob, mobocracy, yeah? yeah. We, we'll address these questions. We're here with Abbas Faz, who has worked for 30 years with Amnesty International, and now is a lecturer at Essex University. He teaches and works in the space of human rights. And as we discussed today, earlier in the show, we have a crisis, a huge global crisis, uh, Abbas, I did talk about what's happening in India. I mean, the situation uh, where you have a certain kind of mob taking over, you know, which is kind of dangerous. And uh, to be honest, you know, no one wants to face that. Uh, you have uh, everyone from uh, the big actors like Shah Rukh Khan to, uh, you know, big journalists facing the heat. You know, they say something and suddenly they have huge amount of abuse coming in terms of uh, this digital trolling. And uh, there, there, you're made to believe that there is, a, there is a side, there is a vicious, vociferous, uh, you know, mob out there, uh, which is there to get you, and you dare not cross the line, dare not say something which they don't want to hear. And on the other side, you also have these kind of forces uh, uh, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, and in, uh, you know, in this whole, uh, uh, kind of uh, South Asian, if I can say, the quasi-democratic uh, nation states we have. I mean, India by, uh, you know, at least so far has managed to uphold, uh, unless, uh, you know, you count the few aberrations in the last few years of lynching and all those things which have happened. But by and large, they have, there has been a balance, check and balance. But we do see increasingly in 
countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh, where suddenly the mobs have more power than ever. I mean, a mob dictates in Bangladesh who they want to punish and who they think uh, has gone against uh, uh, the Sharia or the law or you know the Islamic State. And so it has happened in Pakistan, where they decide to do something and the state intervenes later. The state seems to be almost powerless. And how do you see, I mean, you know, there's one issue where the governments are trying to control and nudge out someone uh, like Amnesty International, which stands up for the weak, for the vulnerable, for the minority. But on the other hand, you have motivated mobs, which are kind of carrying out the act first, and the governments are literally powerless. I mean, how do you balance the situation? Where does, uh, and that's where somewhere I think there's a bit of resentment against organizations like Amnesty International, because people stand up and say, hey, they were there when this was happening or that was happening. They didn't uh, kind of, you know, stand up or walk in there. But when uh, we are doing this, then they stand up. So there's a little bit of that imbalance. There's a little bit of that kind of, uh, kind of a sense of, uh, you know, justice, which they then try to inject into this whole thing, where also there's a sense of resentment against anyone which is, um, let's say, Western, uh, based out of London or in the West, where they say, okay, these rights talk about human rights, but where mm. were they when this happened historically? So there's that wrong sense of chronology being played out, where uh, yeah. they're trying to put two and two together, but in a very misplaced sense of uh, the situation, if, if you get what I'm trying to say. Absolutely, Manish. You are absolutely putting your finger on a very, very important issue. I personally believe that it is important to bring any authority, mm -hmm. any authority to account, to be able to question authorities who are taking a higher ground to, you know, and ask them questions about their conducts. And really, you know, I would be the first person to uh, kind of uh, support anyone who wants to question uh, the work that Amnesty International does. I think, you know, I think people should be able to do that. They should be able to, you know, question uh, the work that the government of India is doing, the government of Bangladesh is doing, the government of Pakistan, as you mentioned, all sorts of governments, you know. We have seen the erosion of democracy in all countries of South Asia. Uh, mm -hmm. Afghanistan is struggling with democracy. Mm -hmm. And we know that the Taliban are being supported by, you know, outside powers, and they continue to be a problem in Afghanistan. We know that Pakistan is, uh, you know, the um, uh, kind of army in Pakistan has a lot of uh, kind of power, and there are allegations that it interferes with the political situation there. In uh, Bangladesh, we have seen the erosion of democracy day by day and year by year. In uh, Sri Lanka, we have a serious problem mm -hmm. there. Uh, the only country that really at the moment, uh, and also, you know, in India, we were hoping that at least India hmm. would be holding up, you know, some principles, saying mm -hmm. that in the face of all these kind of, you know, difficulties in the problems that are developing in other countries, how they really, uh, you know, kind of turn their back on the achievements of their people, turn their back on democracy, on respect for human rights, at least India would not do that. Mm -hmm. So I personally uh, thought that, you know, India would be standing up against any uh, effort to erode those, those principles. The only other country that really, and because I've been, you know, closely engaged in the development of democracy and respect for human rights there, is the Maldives. It's a small country. Mm -hmm. For the time being, really, if you look at it, you know, in the entire South Asia, we just have the Maldives. Mm -hmm. And it is caught in between two uh, kind of regional powers. One is um, India and the other one is China. So both of those, mm -hmm. they want to impose their system mm -hmm. of not just the economic and global and trade system, but also they want to impose their political system on this country. Mm -hmm. And of course, China was doing that mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. They've come to their senses now. Mm -hmm. India was supposed to be like the kind of, you know, light of 
democracy yeah. in the region, it is losing its, its, its force. And, and Manish, it is very important for me to also mention this, because mm -hmm. uh, when I've been talking to my other um, South Asian colleagues, they, they seem to not be fairly aware of this particular mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, analysis that I get from you know places like, for example, Chatham House, mm -hmm. all sorts of other organizations who are very seriously looking at the global power structure, mm -hmm. the analysis that is coming out is really mm -hmm. that uh, the United States and the West are somehow becoming less powerful than they were in the past. Yep. So in a situation like that, it is very important for, this is, this is important. Why is it important? It is important because we've got to understand that if we don't do anything to change the situation for you know more respect for human rights in the countries of the region mm -hmm. other countries even if they kind of you know have the will mm -hmm. and i and that is there is a lot of suspicion that they may not even have the will mm -hmm. even if they have the will countries of the west mm -hmm. they will not be able to do anything mm -hmm. They will mm -hmm. not be able to do anything for a number of reasons, mm -hmm. because the West doesn't has no longer got that like kind of economic foothold in in Asia. Mm -hmm. It has been replaced by another superpower, so uh, kind of a nation superpower. Mm -hmm. There is this kind of you know policy of looking east, which means that you know we kind of open up to you, China. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, if we open up to you, it's got you know, for governments in South Asia, especially mm -hmm. if we open up to you, China, then there's a lot of advantage for us. Mm -hmm. One advantage is that we can do whatever we want. We can just, you know, forget about our constitutions, forget about human rights, uh, just, you know, kind of repeat prescription of exactly what you are doing in your country because you are financially, uh, economically successful, that's all that matters to us. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter that you've got such a lot of kind of corruption going on. It, it doesn't matter that you don't have mm -hmm. the rule of law. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. that there is no freedom of expression in your country. Mm -hmm. We are very happy to you know, follow all of that. And that mm -hmm. is what is happening. So it is very important for us to actually know mm -hmm. that really mm -hmm. we are only on our own in in western in, in eastern countries mm -hmm. especially in the countries of south asia there's no one to support you yeah. can we cannot expect support from india because if they are really doing what they are doing now with an organization like amnesty mm -hmm. how are they supposed to you know how can you expect them to do anything you know uh, in support of any other human rights defender mm -hmm. the, I think Western countries won't be able to support because mm -hmm. I mean the I mean one reason why Trump is so kind of inward mm -hmm. uh, looking is not just you know because so suddenly you know he is mm -hmm. uh, I mean I have a lot of reservation mm -hmm. or serious concerns about some of the statements mm -hmm. that Trump has made but mm -hmm. it's an indication of what the country is feeling at the moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it is it is the fact that you know the country is feeling that they are losing their power globally mm -hmm. so they are trying to you know kind mm -hmm. of strengthen and that is not going to work anyway mm -hmm. strengthen themselves you know kind of internally so that is what i'm trying to say the mm -hmm. um, assumption that you know kind of there is a fight against the western countries now mm -hmm. this is also uh, a misplaced one yeah. another issue is that development managed if you uh, mm -hmm. do stop me if i'm uh, you know talking too much <laughs> no, no. Uh, the other one is the development uh, uh, of of what people call populism. Mm. Uh, populism is what we've got mm. in uh, Hungary, you know, mm. what we've got in uh, uh, kind of uh, North Korea, mm -hmm. what we've got in Iran, what we've got in uh, what we had in, in, in Britain, you know, mm. during the Brexit period. Mm -hmm. You know, the way that, for, yeah. for example, Boris Johnson was saying, you know, we are going to save our country from the clutches of the, mm -hmm. the European Union courts, for yeah. example. Yeah. So this is populism. And that mm -hmm. populism has been always the case in the countries of South Asia. Mm -hmm. But now it is even actually more so. Mm -hmm. So we were hoping that at least a country like India would not be 
succumbing to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't believe that it will be long term. I think, you know, I think the essence of India is democracy. Uh, as I said, the state stays on, mm -hmm. the governments come and go. So mm -hmm. I still have a lot of hope for India. Yeah. No, thank you so much. I think so, you said you made very, very important points. And uh, thank you for your optimism as well that uh, we need to see India as a resilient democratic nation for the whole region, for the region's stability. And also what you pointed out, uh, what's happening with China. I mean, there is this whole uh, kind of uh, pandering to the Chinese money because it makes the government bring in some money, makes them look that they're doing something for the betterment of the economics of the country. But in effect, what they're trying to pander to is a rogue nation. I mean, I'm using a very strong word here, uh, but the Chinese policies has almost, almost kind of subverted itself to supplying money with one hand and taking the country and its grip with the other hand. So it's, it's very dangerous. It's far more dangerous than what we had in the old days of Cold War with uh, Soviet Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't think the governments uh, have been clearly able to see that other than using it for their own agenda, like Trump has done that, uh, calling the virus China virus. I mean, that kind of, again, a very populist uh, uh, yes. kind of subversion of the fact. But uh, there, there is a real and grave danger uh, with China, with its influence in countries of Africa. Uh, you said Maldives, but also in closer uh, to in the subcontinent, uh, Pakistan, where again, yeah. Imran Khan has overtly uh, kind of supported the Chinese regime, uh, yes. but uh, played down what has happened with the Ulgur Muslims, for instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, somewhere, like, we see that kind of narrative, which is supported, by, again, by the media. So the media also has been kind of taken over. It's playing, uh, uh, you know, what the government is saying is playing second fiddle to it. And we mm -hmm. have uh, a serious risk. And now, when you see what happened in France and the response from, you know, some of the people in Pakistan, it's, again, not not. I'm not saying they're not supposed to respond, but the kind of responses we're seeing is very populist and veering mm. towards a dangerous nation state, which is capable of saying and doing things which goes against the ethos of a democratic open society. So you mm. have all this real risk emerging. Mm. I'm going to address the elephant in the room, uh, which is basically a lot of the situations seem to be coming from the fear, the fear of, uh, you know, what has happened in France, like you have this person who goes against the nation state policy of uh, liberal and uh, kind of, you know, uh, right to express themselves, uh, whether it goes against a certain religious uh, institution. So they would do that against any church. And in this particular instance, it went against the Muslim church. So uh, there is this whole kind of uh, basic conflict which is happening, which we have mm. seen here in most of the Western countries. And the way mm. to address, I mean, Britain has addressed it in a very, uh, I would say, successful way because multiculturalism, unlike in many other places, has been reasonably successful in the United Kingdom. Uh, over the period of time, it has kind of created that dialogue in spite of a few instances of uh, whatever you call it, uh, there has been a reasonable dialogue. Uh, you don't see that kind of antagonism here. Uh, Muslims in every part of life here in the UK are very much enshrined there in the Conservative Party, in the Labour Party, and everywhere else. And they have a voice. And I don't think there is any uh, systematic erosion of their rights, possibly. However, we do see uh, some kind of themes emerging wherein there is a conflict. Uh, one of the conflicts has been uh, with Amnesty International, where uh, Geeta Segal, who resigned, uh, uh, I think, last year, uh, based on the fact that Amnesty was not heeding to her views and was playing, uh, uh, I think, if I'm getting the name right, Beg, who was, uh, who was there in Guantanamo Bay and who was supported by Amnesty and who kind of... Uh, very fairly talked about what the American government was doing to inmates in Guantanamo Bay, but went a bit ahead wherein he was pushing his jihadist ideology and was kind of uh, misogynistic in his views and was very openly against women. Uh, and Amnesty kind of uh, 
uh, accepted his views or kind of was seen to be kind of uh, playing it forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, Geeta Segal, who is renowned uh, uh, kind of human rights activist, has been with Amnesty for many years, has got a lot of credentials because she worked with the uh, South Hall Black Sisters as well in the past and actually is, uh, uh, is the daughter of uh, Nain Tara Segal, who, uh, is, who was the uh, sister of the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru. So you have this kind of conflict coming up in an organization like Amnesty here in the heart of uh, the Western democracy here in London, of all places. And you have this kind of very conflicting view emerging, which makes me question that is there something gone wrong? Uh, is the Western liberal stance somewhere slightly subverted or is not able to call a spade a spade or has kind of been compromised in some way wherein on one hand they definitely want to support the weak and the vulnerable and very commendable for, uh, for that stance and we all need to support it all out but somewhere they're getting this kind of state of confusion where they have to accept uh, uh, someone who seems to uphold jihadist views as uh, panacea to the Western problem. So what, what do you think? Where, where are we? Is something uh, not going right? Absolutely, Manish. I think, I think that episode is a scar on the conscience of amnesty, on the conscience of a lot of us who were working with amnesty at that time. And I do feel that, you know, Amnesty did not actually deal with the issues that Gita Saga was raising mm -hmm. at that time. And I, I do feel that, you know, that was a shortcoming on behalf of Amnesty. And, uh, and that shortcoming was uh, kind of, you know, it was uh, uh, at the time when the structures of the organization had been reshaped by the then Secretary General. I mean, the episode actually took place after she left. Mm -hmm. But uh, the then Secretary General of Amnesty, just before uh, uh, Gita left, was uh, very kind of, you know, she had, she had her own style of, of uh, organizational uh, management, mm -hmm. and that didn't really help a huge amount to kind of you know, deal with issues like that. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned earlier, I think it is good to be able to actually you know, go inside Amnesty and see what is going on, because mm -hmm. uh, it is part of you know, our struggle for human rights, and mm -hmm. it is part of our struggle to know what the human rights organization are doing. It's not mm -hmm. just the issue of, for example, you know, in the past, uh, you know, we have had investigation into the activities of human rights organizations in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and some people, you know, from those organizations have been placed under investigation. Mm -hmm. I think it is important not to see maybe one of the, um, you know, kind of uh, assumptions that we as uh, thinking Eastern people, you know, thinking people mm -hmm. uh, have had is that, you know, these organizations should be considered beyond flaws. Mm -hmm. And I don't mm -hmm. think that is a good attitude. I think we've got to be able to actually criticize ourselves. Mm -hmm. yep. We've got to be able to criticize other mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I've been telling, you know, my students that really, you know, the first person that you've got to criticize is your lecturer. Mm -hmm. Am I actually giving you yeah. what you need to know? And, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. So it is good. And I think, you know, the very fact. Now, let me just say something. Yeah. Amnesty is uh, kind of, you know, like any other institution, mm -hmm. like any other organization, mm -hmm. like any other government, if you like, mm -hmm. like any other, you know, grouping, mm -hmm. it is a balance of, you know, so many different forces, mm -hmm. so many different attitudes, mm -hmm. so many different expectations, mm -hmm. and so many different approaches. Mm -hmm. There are people who, you know, kind of consider, um, you know, kind of 
Western principles to be supreme. Mm -hmm. There are people who actually are completely opposed to that. Mm -hmm. And that is great because, you know, an organization that has that level of interaction. Mm -hmm. There are also people who, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember years ago, many, many years ago, this is like kind of 25 years ago, I took mm -hmm. um, uh, a film crew with myself mm -hmm. to Pakistan and then I went to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. At that time I was working on those two countries. So mm -hmm. the idea was to uh, investigate the human rights situation there. Mm -hmm. And I had a very young, uh, very English, if you like, uh, uh, cameraman with me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he was fascinated by, you know, kind of the, um, he was really fascinated by the, by what the Taliban were doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I just asked him, I said, look, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to stop you. It is mm -hmm. great that you're fascinated by, you know, the mm -hmm. kind of material that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. can I ask you why you're so fascinated? And then immediately he said, look, this is pure Islam. Yeah, as if you know, as if Islam is like kind of you know something that, I mean, pure Islam is like kind of you know that is a very strange approach by this person hmm. to a situation. So to him, you know, he just was equating Islam with what was mm -hmm. what the Taliban were doing. Mm -hmm. Whereas we know that you know, I mean, Islam is really an interpretation that many different Muslims have. Mm -hmm. So what kind of, what interpretation mm -hmm. of Islam are you going to accept? Yeah. Is that the interpretation, for example, yeah. that exists in Bangladesh, or is it the one that exists in Pakistan, for example, or is it the one that exists in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in, or you know, all Sufi, sorts of... Or from the Sufi learnings, which has been, yes. you know, yes. prevalent in certain so, parts of South Asia as well. Yeah. So, I mean, these are all the different type of investigation, mm -hmm. uh, the different type of kind of, uh, uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. the different type of interpretations. Mm -hmm. And unless, unless one, you know, unless one knows about these things, people think that, you know, Islam is just one thing. So there's a uh, there's, there's lot of uh, misinformation, miseducation and stereotyping, uh, which is prevalent in media. Yeah. We... At that time, unfortunately, yeah. someone, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, who was in a higher position at Amnesty mm -hmm. uh, developed the mm -hmm. idea of a defensive jihad and that didn't go down well with many people in the organization he I from what I understand was mm -hmm. that he actually retracted that but you know it is it is something I'm, I'm just trying to say that you know it is good that we know about these kind of, you know, Issues. tensions within these organizations. Yeah. Yeah. Because then we can actually contribute. We know, you know, which part of the organization is that part mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we want it to develop and mm -hmm. which part is the part that we don't want it to yeah. develop. And yeah. that is in every society. In societies, there are forces that are, you know, kind mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. there are uh, mm -hmm. racist groups, there are, you know, also mm -hmm. groups that are defenders of human rights. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, it depends, you know, which one do we want to really kind of mm -hmm. associate ourselves with. So, in a way, um, I don't think I don't think it is I don't think it is right to kind of see amnesty as just one single entity. Yeah. Amnesty yeah. is a combination of many different forces. Let's hope. And the one reason why we were, you know, thinking of at that time, I was mm -hmm. part of the process mm -hmm. of really moving amnesty to Asia. So the Asian Department of Amnesty should move to Asia. Mm -hmm. The African Department of Amnesty should move to Africa because of all of these things. Because, you know, so that the people who are working at the organiz in the organization, they are exposed to people who are actually in the field, mm -hmm. to the views, to understanding, to interpretations and all of that. Very, so, very I mean, important point, well, uh, mm. Abbas. But we're coming to uh, closure. Uh, I think I'm getting the signal that we are running out of time. So oh, let me again say it was such a pleasure to speak to you. And I wish there were more people like you. I truly wish that there were more people like you who took upon important issues and causes like human rights. Unfortunately, in our 
striving towards material welfare and uh, even in South Asia and many parts of the world which are relatively poor, there's a whole emphasis on doing things which are uh, economically viable and there's not enough, not enough movement, not enough kind of, uh, I would say, impetus to learn, study and kind of, uh, you know, sow the seeds and kind of lay the foundation of a better society. That's something which has been, uh, in a way, societies have ignored and uh, uh, the political forces have kind of taken advantage of that where a lot of political forces are emanating from a strata society which is not well informed, well educated and we have a situation uh, and here in the United Kingdom, like you said, what happened during Brexit, it's, it's if, if I could say that in hindsight, it was uh, people's fears playing up and down uh, and making them motivated and some smart uh, captioning and advertising could motivate and f bring the fear in them and make certain calls. So without being judgmental about it, we do have as a society to place a uh, higher emphasis on social and fundamental values, one of the fund most fundamental rights which we as human beings have, the human rights and the right to express freely and to have our own belief and to live in accordance with that peacefully with others. So that is something very, very fundamental to every healthy society on which you have then can build a sustainable and long-term economically viable society. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, mm -hmm. And welcome again yeah. to the Manish Tiwari Show. Hope to see you in future. Thank you. Thank and you. thanks, London, Thank you for very being much, here. Manish. It has been a pleasure being here. Thank thanks. you for inviting me. Thanks a lot. Cheers. All right, viewers. So here was the first opening episode of the Manish Tiwari Show. We'll be here again every Saturday. See you again soon. Bye.